Hello Internet, I'm Dan and this is my video on how I built the Salerno subwoofer. For the subwoofer I had two main design goals. Meaningful output at single digit frequencies and the ability to play back at peak reference levels which is 115 decibels. Now this is my original design for the Salerno subwoofer. It was going to be a sono tube design using uh, what's basically a, a large cardboard tube that they use as concrete forms. However, I was living at the Ger in Germany at the time and I couldn't have find easy access to such things. So I had to go with a box design. The box design was going to be a little bit more expensive, but it was pretty much the only option I, option I had at the time. And so this is the design I eventually went with. Now you can see the overall design of the subwoofer, and this is actually two subwoofers. I went with two subwoofers because when you have two subwoofers, it's a little easier to uh, have a smooth frequency output rather than just having one subwoofer. So it helps you to have a better sound throughout the And so this is the two subwoofers put back to back. And the eventual design did change. I was going to have them kind of lock into each other, but they didn't do that in the end. They uh, I just forewent this and just had them sitting on the ground because I figured I wasn't really going to have any issues because they were so heavy. I believe they weigh about 200 pounds a piece after they've been made. They were constructed out of 3 quarter inch MDF. You can see the dimensions from here is 37 and a half inches by 24 inches by 49 and a half inches. And that's the important dimensions because that determines the box's overall volume. This is a program called WinISD and basically it's a program that a lot of DIY subwoofer makers will use in order to model out how their subwoofer is going to behave theoretically. I won't explain how to get the driver, that's kind of beyond the scope of this video, but anyhow. So the way I modeled out my subwoofer is I used a Stereo Integrity HT18D4 driver. Uh, the drivers were only $190 at the time and were widely considered to be a huge bargain in the DIY subwoofer community. Unfortunately, Stereo Integrity doesn't make this driver anymore, but they have come up with a new version of the driver, but they also charge $700 for it. But anyhow, at the time, with this driver that I used, this is the model I came up with. What you're seeing here is an SPL graph of theoretical output. So, putting 400 watts in, I would get roughly 109 decibels at 11 hertz. So the box design that got me with this is a 650 liter, which is actually about about 23 cubic feet of volume. The uh, tuning frequency, given that volume combined with the uh, vent design, which was a six point or six and a quarter inch vent diameter and a 25 inch vent length, is gives me a tuning frequency of 11 hertz. So I would get this much output at 11 hertz with this vented design. So you may ask, why does a subwoofer have to be so big? Well, this design that I used is called a large low tune design. Basically, you make a really large box with a lot of volume, and you put a big driver in it, and you get a low tuning frequency, in this case, 11 hertz. Why would you want an 11 hertz tuning frequency? Well, there's a lot of movies that do have content down to that level. Unfortunately, most of us don't really get to experience it, but if you do have a subwoofer that can help you experience that, then it's a very memorable experience to be had because not only will you get all the bass of the movie, but you're going to get room-shaking bass that you can feel. Now, some of you may be asking why not go with a seal design. Here's a model for a seal design using a, a 8 cubic foot box. Now, what you're going to see is when we go to the signal tab. With the vented design, the large low tune design, I can put 400 watts in and get this much output down at 11 hertz and this much output, roughly 110 dBs, at 20 hertz. With the sealed design, I need to put in a thousand watts of power just to get 110 dB at 20 hertz, about 8 dB less at 10 hertz. So there's a lot less output in the single fre digit frequencies where I want it to be. You can get single digit frequencies using sealed designs, but you're going to need to use two to four sealed boxes to get some meaningful output. And you're also going to need to use some EQ to get rid of this hump up here. And you're going to need to spend a lot more on more powerful amplifiers. Using large low tune design, what you're doing is you're giving up the you're giving up a small box, you're trading it off for a huge box, but what you're getting in return is 
the requirement for a lot less system input power, so you're going to save money in amplifiers that way. So going back over the critical dimensions of this, uh, what we have is 23 cubic feet tuned to 11 hertz. The vent diameter was turned out to be six and a quarter inches by 25 inches long. That gave me a uh, first port residence at 270 hertz, which is well above what this would be playing at, but it also allowed for enough uh, diameter so that I wouldn't get any chuffing. If I went with a smaller diameter, you can get chuffing, which is basically you hear the air moving in and out of the vent at low frequencies. Now, in case you're wondering how accurately when ISD is able to model a subwoofer design, keep in mind this is my just the, the model I made in the computer. And this is an actual measurement from the subwoofer. You can see here, there's the uh, knee right here around 11-ish hertz. And it's right about where, it is, where it's at in the uh, model here. Here's the cut sheet that I use. This is a uh, parts list. This is using two sheets of 3 quarter inch MDF. So there's the one cut sheet there. And there's another cut sheet. I don't remember what program I used to generate these cut sheets. But you basically put in the dimensions you need and it'll figure out the most efficient way to get what you need out of your uh, supply stock so that you're not wasting any more wood than you absolutely need to. One other thing I need to show you about a sealed versus vented design. This is the uh, input for the sealed subwoofer is a thousand watts and 400 watts for the vented one in order to get the uh, similar SPL at 20 hertz, which is the THX recommended lower end. But what you're going to see with your cone excursion with the vented design here, it stays well below the uh, X max setting. Uh, once it gets below 10 hertz, it goes up, but most home theater amplifiers and home theater receivers are going to be rolling off about this point anyway. And I actually stopped running with any sort of filter or any sort of high pass filter. I just have it unfiltered and I haven't had a problem with anything bottoming out below that. And I'm sure there might be some content where that could happen, but I haven't experienced that yet. But with the seal design, you're seeing that you're going past X max well before you get anywhere near the single digit frequencies. I mean, it's going up here. That's why you need several sealed subwoofers in order to get down to the single digits because in order to protect your driver from over excursion, uh, you're just going to have to go with more. And I should mention that if you have two subwoofers versus one, adding that second subwoofer gives you an automatic six decibels of gain by the virtue of the fact that you have two subwoofers versus one. So whereas one subwoofer might play only to 109 dB, you put a second subwoofer in the room, both of them together are going to play up to 115 decibels. So what you see here is uh, what you might call a kit for one Salerno subwoofer. Actually, it shows two pipes here that were used as vents, but actually just one goes in each one. But this is the kit, uh, basically the wood after I got it all cut up to make one of the subwoofers. Now this is a circle jig I used for the plunge router that uh, was uh, that I borrowed from uh, the pastor of the church I was going to. He had a nice uh, set of wood tools and he let me borrow some of his stuff. So. I uh, made this circle jig here. Uh, you can actually buy one off of Amazon. You can search for a circle jig, but this was a, uh, I was trying to do this a little bit on the cheap, so I made my own circle jig and it worked out very well.
Now for the ends of the ports, it needed to be flared, and so I used two pieces of MDF sandwiched together. The one piece goes onto here, the other one's glued onto the end, and I routed out this with a roundover so that there was a nice uh, flare so that it wouldn't cause any, or it would cause less turbulence, if any. Now for the port exit, I wanted a really large roundover to minimize the chance of any sort of port noise or chuffing that could happen. Now, I definitely don't recommend you do it this way. This is actually probably a bit dangerous. It's against all the manufacturer's recommendations, and if you lose your grip on the router, then you could probably really hurt yourself. But I didn't have easy access to a tool rental place. But if you have easy access to a tool rental place, I just recommend renting the largest roundover bit you can find. Uh, if you buy them, they're like over a hundred bucks for the size roundover I needed. But try and rent a really large roundover bit and do it that way. Don't do it this way because th this is fairly dangerous. Here are the raw drivers. These are again the Stereo Integrity HD 18 D4 drivers sitting on the sofa. You can see that they're quite large, nice 18 inch drivers. There's one with my kid in the background for size reference. And when you're working with MDF, I was wearing a dust mask. I didn't have it on for this video because I was, I guess, changing drill bits. But you can see MDF is very dusty. I mean, just all over the ground, MDF is dusty. So when you make this, expect to make a lot of dust. Now you can make it with, uh, you want to use like uh, beech birch plywood, which is a more expensive plywood if you wanted to have a nicer finish, but I just went with MDF because I wasn't too terribly concerned about looks. This is the faceplate of one of the subwoofers. Now what I did with the driver is uh, there's actually hurricane nuts here. Now a problem that people have had using hurricane nuts to mount their drivers is if you take the driver out sometimes the hurricane nuts would back out of uh, the wood you put them in and so what I did was I notched out these on the back and I glued them on there so that those hurricane nuts are not going to go anywhere. <laughs> Here's a side view showing uh, there's the bolts. This is sandwiched with uh, another piece of MDF. And you can see the cutouts here for the hurricane nuts. And this is the hole for the driver, or for the uh, for the vent. And this is just the dry fit of a box. There's no bracing or anything like that. This is dry fitted in and you can see the, uh, the cutout I made to uh, attach the speaker cables. Now it's getting glued together. The top is not being glued here. This is just kind of making sure that everything's held down, but everything's clamped using really big clamps. And there's me inside of it. I mean, just to show you how huge this thing is. All right now the bracing is installed in here. When you make a subwoofer, it needs to be braced. If you don't have bracing, the box is going to sound hollow and basically it's going to color the sound. So you want the box to be as inert as possible. You don't want it to vibrate. You don't want to have that hollow sound when you knock on it. So this way with all this bracing, it's going to be nice and stiff and it's not going to color the sound. Also all these braces I rounded over just in case there's any turbulence issues. And I rounded all this out with a router so that I'm not taking up too much volume. And there's the driver. You can see the uh, the big flange here and uh, another one over here, or a nice big round over. And this was something that was suggested on the ABS forum. Uh, instead of padding the sides to do away with uh, like internal reflections causing issues, what you do is you take your baffle material and put it in the middle. And it's a lot more efficient that way because all the sound waves travel through the middle, but not all the sound waves hit the side. And that's a give you an idea of how much baffling I used in there. Now we're about to glue the top on. And I mean, this is a great use for weights. Just put as much weight as you can on there and just let it set because you don't want there to be any voids in there. And I definitely recommend if you do make something like this, uh, don't do it unless you have access to a good wood shop or a very large table saw. Uh, if, you, if you're trying to use a little table saw, you're probably not going to have a good time. I, I had access to a very nice wood shop and a very big table saw so I can get all these good, nice exact cuts where I needed. 
and that's the finished sub. Now, later on, this overhang here, I ended up cutting off of the subwoofer, as you've seen in the uh, picture in the introduction of the video. For the uh, input connectors, I used Neutrix Speak On connectors, and that's this guy here. And I actually have a video that I'll link to where I showed how to assemble these things. Not too hard. Very good connector, very robust. And here's one of the access panels. Basically, I had to have access panels so that I could wire the connector onto the driver itself. So I had to have the wires on the driver going to the connector. So I needed to have an access panel where I could take it off and get in there so that I could do any work if I needed to. These are the hurricane nuts I was talking about. And these are the little blocks with a little bit of a cutout so that I can basically put those on top of the hole and these are never going to back out, ever. So there's the second subwoofer all braced and ready for the top. As an added bonus, this is my measuring output from my Onkyo receiver. I measured the output of the LFE channel using an O-scope, and we can see that the minus 3 dB point is somewhere between 3 and 4 hertz. So it will give you all the output below 20 hertz, uh, all the way down to 4 hertz before really rolling off. And according to some measurements I read online for my uh, amplifier that I'm using, which is iNuke 3000 DSP, uh, the amplifier has a similar roll-off to this. Here are several measurements I took of the subwoofer just recently. Uh, these are several sweeps from uh, 5 to 100 hertz, and if increasing uh, power levels, I was able to get up to about 112 decibels at uh, 12 hertz, but uh, at this point I was experiencing a lot of compression up here, and what this was, this wasn't the uh, a limit of the subwoofer, this was a limit of my amplifier, so if I want to have more output up here, I need more amplifier. But I'm crossed over at about uh, 40 hertz with my uh, main speakers. So. so if I want to get more output, I'm going to need to uh, get a second amplifier and just run each one in uh, bridged mono to get a little bit more output from these up at the highest levels. And these were done with no filter and no limiter. And this is uh, it's sh not really showing any signs of distress down in the uh, single digit frequencies so it doesn't look like I'm running into any cone excursion issues and indeed I didn't hear it slapping or doing anything uh, scary other than shaking the door. So am I satisfied with the subwoofer's performance? Yes I am. The sub performs very well. It gets up to, it doesn't quite get to the 115 decibel point, but that's at reference levels. Now, I generally don't listen to movies at reference level because that is actually very loud, but about minus five from reference is good for uh, movies for me. And so I can turn the subwoofer up a little bit. It gives me just a little bit of headroom so I could run my bass a little bit hot. And it plays uh, plenty loud enough and it uh, gives me the good room shaking moments when they're there in those movies. Now, is there a downside to a subwoofer like this? Yes, there is. The problem is it can ruin movies for you. How can an awesome subwoofer like these ruin a movie? Well, there are movies that have great bass. How to Train Your Dragon is a great example of a movie with great, excellent bass. Lots of good bass that engages the room throughout. You can feel it, especially at the end of the battle. However, in the sequel, How to Train Your Dragon 2, which is also a good movie, I just can't quite enjoy it because whoever the sound engineer who made that movie was, he rolled off the low frequency at 20 hertz. And so while there is bass in that movie, it doesn't engage the room. It doesn't shake the room. It doesn't shake the sofa. It's just not there. Now, if you don't have a subwoofer like this, you're not going to miss that. You're going to watch the movie and you're going to think everything's fine. But if you did go through the trouble to make a huge subwoofer that will engage the room, that will give you that bass that you can feel, you're going to know when it's not there. There are several movies I've watched where like, there's been like a huge explosion or some big huge thing happening and you're expecting the room to be shaking and nothing. So that's the one downside is sometimes you'll be watching a movie, you'll be into it and you'll be taken right out of the action because there's going to be that base moment and your room is not shaking and you're going to be disappointed. Now fortunately the people on the database website, that's data-base.com, there is a thread on there where there's a, a uh, guy who 
post equalization that you can do to get some of the low frequency back. It doesn't work in every movie, but it does work in some. But you you can only do it on the movies he's done, or you can kind of mess around with it. It needs to be you need to be a little bit more advanced. You need to be able to apply uh, parametric equalization to your outputs. So if you have that skill set, if you're a real hobbyist into it who can do something like that, then that can be an option for you. But otherwise, if you don't do that, there's just going to be some movies out there that just are disappointing because they don't have the base where you're expecting them to have the base. It's unfortunate, but it's a sad reality. But for the movies that do have that base, very awesome. Uh, War of the Worlds is one of the uh, gold standard movies that has a lot of bass that engages the room. There is a scene in the re the new remake of Flight of the Phoenix where the airplane's going down, and boy, that'll make you afraid to fly if you uh, if you watch it with the subwoofer. I mean, it, it feels like the whole room is going inverted as the plane's going down. Uh, there's I've heard Hacksaw Ridge has some good bass. I haven't watched that one personally, but th there's a lot of movies out there that have some really good bass and. If you go through the trouble to build a subwoofer like this, you won't regret it. So there it is. There's how to uh, build a huge subwoofer. If you have any questions, please post it down in the comments section. Here's some other videos of the subwoofer in action. And uh, thank you for watching.